Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to um, Socialist Workers Party's uh, Marxism 21 online festival. My name is Moira Samuels, and I'll be chairing the meeting this afternoon. I am a long standing member of the Socialist Workers Party, a um, member of the West London, North West London Stand Up to Racism, and um, a Grenfell Community uh, Campaign for Justice. Um, we are very uh, privileged this afternoon to have three speakers um, for our meeting on race, class and revolt, strategies for black liberation. Um, we have Leila Hao, Wayman Bennett and Nadia Saeed. Um, I will be introducing each speaker as they just before they speak. If I could say just say something about the meeting, um, each speaker will speak for a short time, and then at the end, we will uh, after they've spoken, we will open the meeting to any questions or any contributions. Um, if people don't want to actually use their virtual hand, which is at the bottom of your screen, and 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 speak, um, please feel free to put the questions into. Um, the chat but we've closed the chat for everybody to see just for security reasons but I will um, read out your questions if you feel that you don't want to actually you know ask them yourself so um, I think we can begin our meeting and um, we will begin with Nadia Saeed who is um, a member of Socialist Workers Party and a activist, the Black Lives Matter and Stand Up to Racism. Welcome, Nadia. Thanks very much, um, Moira. And um, I'm not going to take too much time because, um, to be honest, I'm quite looking forward to hearing um, from the speakers around the question of strategies for black liberation. And I also want to hear what everyone else has to say in the discussion. Um, so I won't take too long, but really I wanted to really open the meeting by talking about how much we continue to see the impact and the ripples of the Black Lives Matter movement we saw reinvigorated last summer, um, not least, but also most recently with, you know, the, Derek Sho the verdict against Derek Chauvin, where he was found guilty on all, charge, uh, all charges following the murder of George Floyd. Um, but really... We wouldn't be having this discussion in this meeting if we thought that was the end of it. We obviously know there's a long way to go, not just on the question of justice, um, but actually if we're talking about serious um, change against, in, against uh, institutional racism and, and racism that affects people's everyday lives. And really, I, you know, I wanted to use my time um, briefly to talk about how the movement is really at a crossroads at the moment, either from you know, being incorporated like we're seeing in the United States, the attempt to the massive pressure for the Black Lives Matter movement to be pulled in behind the Democratic Party machinery. And we know where that's gone. We remember the Black Lives Matter movement uh, back in 2015, 2016, um, that was diffused in this way. Or like we're seeing here in the UK, um, the response to that movement and its impacts uh, with you know, ideological backlash um, and repression like we're seeing uh, with what the Tories are mounting, not just with the Sewer Report, um, but the Police Crime Courts, uh, Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, really. Um, and our response to both, I mean, our solidarity and strength we offer to our brothers and sisters fighting in the United States, but our response here has to be um, absolutely sort of, uh, you know, absolutely uh, just, uh, absolutely just uh, rejecting any of these attempts and actually pushing the movement forward and making sure that actually, you know, if this is not going to be something that is a moment, but a movement that delivers lasting change, then actually, you know, not only just defending against the offensives against it, um, but actually taking things uh, forward by uh, fighting harder, you know, taking the, uh, the radicalism and the militancy of that movement, you know, further into our communities, our workplaces, our schools and campuses. Um, and so, Really, I wanted to use my time to highlight that actually, you know, I think we're at a very key juncture um, because of, you know, the sort of explosion that we saw in the summer and the ripples it had um, within society. Um, and actually what we do at this stage, I think, will matter um, 
as to you know the lessons we learn uh, the sort of movement that we can build um and the sort of changes you know the lasting sort of changes that we can actually have that sort of show for for everything that people are fighting for um but i look forward to to hearing what the other speakers have to say um and um encourage everyone to to come in and the discussion because um it's a very important one but i'll leave it at that chair Thank you, Nadia, for that introduction. Um, our next speaker <clears throat> is Leila Howe. And Leila Howe is um, the previous editor of The Race Collective. She is responsible for the Darkest Howe legacy and has uh, been author of um, Year to Stay, Year to Fight, and From Bob Bobby to Babylon. So welcome, Leila. And Leila will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. OK, Thank hopefully. You. OK, hi, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. So when Brian uh, Richardson, who I have quite a close uh, relationship, friendship with, asked me to speak, I said to him that really I didn't think I should. I told him because I, the reason for that is because I'm not an activist today. I'm doing a lot of work with um, the Dark Sahar Legacy Group and a collective that we have. But much of that is really spent on trying to ensure that the radical black movement that we were involved in is known about by future generations. Um, I attended the Black Lives Matter demonstration outside the embassy. But other than that, when I talk, it's, it's really about our history and lessons that we can learn from our history. So that's what I want to do today. One of the things that strikes me when I see young people being spoken to on television or when they speak, uh, sometimes they keep saying nothing has changed, nothing has changed. And so I'm, I'm really sort of framing my talk around the, the, the theory that nothing has changed because in fact a great deal has changed. Massive change has happened in relation to the black community in Britain and society and where we stand today. So it is disheartening sometimes, particularly young people say nothing's changed, the police issues still remain. The police issues remain but there's a, a different approach and strategy which has been informed by our struggle. So I really welcome the interest in the history of the black radical movements of the 60s, 70s and early 80s. Up until recently, there really wasn't very much interest at all. Of course, this, this interest is to do with the, the new consciousness that's arisen from the political turmoil in the United States and the fact that some television programmes happened. Um, in Britain, it's always been easier to look at the United States and South Africa. Um, in Black History Month in schools, people would learn about the bus bo boycott in Alabama, but nothing about the bus boycott in Bristol. They would know about the ANC movement and the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, but they wouldn't know about the New Dual movement in Grenada and their attempts to establish a socialist society. They wouldn't know about the African Caribbean liberation movement in Antigua, which was a very strong organization in the West Indies, which tried to unify political organizations in the West Indies. So the fo focus has always been anywhere but Britain. Race and racism and the fight for, for freedom has always been elsewhere which of course for us as activists and people who know has been very strange given that Britain is the heart of colonialism, of colonial oppression and imperialism. And the fact that of course um, the schools and in society in general has tried to shield populations away from that is very much to do with their, their need to control us. So I was a member of the Black Radical Movement in Britain for some 20 odd years, first in the Black Unity and Freedom Party, and then later as a member of the Race Today Collective, not the Race Collective more, the Race Today Collective. And in both these organisations, we always had a socialist vision for change. In the Black Power Group I was in, the Black Unity and Freedom Party, we called ourselves Marxists, Leninists and Maoists. I mean, really an, an ideology taken from whatever liberation struggles were carrying on in, internationally. But already we had identified that our struggle was a working class struggle. 
For those of you who know a bit about race today, you'll know that it was led by the Marxist ideas of CLR James. And the relevance of class to black, the black liberation movement has always been central in the work that I've done and in our thinking. I want to say this because up until recently, when I had the pleasure, although I'm not sure it was a pleasure, to speak to a local Labour Party group, somebody described the black movement as periphery to working class struggle. And he told me it was identity politics. And I thought in 19, in sorry, in 2021, are we still talking about black struggle as identity identity politics and not being central to the movement for revolutionary change. So I want to say the era I grew up in, the 70s and 80s in Brixton, uh, in Bri Britain and of course in Brixton where we were based, was a period of intense class struggle. The, the population was on the move, it was fighting for rights, a bit, a bit like the Black Lives Matter movement but maybe not so much because this was really about immigrant communities that were based in working class communities. And so Race Today Collective and the immigrant communities, we were in the forefront in the struggle in trade unions, in housing and education, and of course the fight against the police. We talked about the self-organisation of the community. We said we wouldn't lead the community, but we would record and recognise and participate in the struggles of the community. So our strategies and what we developed were very much developed with members of the communities in which we were based. We were a young collective, Race Today was a collective. Um, we were, we published from 74 to 88, so 14 years um, we were based in Brixton. We didn't only record the detail of the struggle, but we analyzed it. Um, we, we, we had as our tool, which surprises many people, Marx's Workers Inquiry. Darkus, who was our editor and the leader of the collective in the sense that he was the person who formed the collective, said that, didn't say we all had to study Marxism, Leninism, which we had attempted to do in the black movement, um, have Marx study classes. But what he said we had to do was read the Workers Inquiry by Karl Marx. And he said we had to do that in order that when we approach working people that, and people who were involved in campaigns, we would be able to ask some questions that not only took gathered information, but also made them reflect themselves on what they were involved in. And for those of you who, who will know Marx's work as inquiry, it's a hundred questions in which if you're interviewing somebody about what they're involved in, it, it helps them, not, uh, it helps you to have an understanding who they are, but also that they have an understanding of what they're involved in. We, we studied seriously. Um, we went away to farmhouses and had weekends, a bit like your festival now, where we analysed the stage of the black working class in Britain. We said what they would and wouldn't do, um, what we could expect. We tried to analyse a bit for the future. I mean, at one of our classes, um, one of the sessions we had, we will always remember in 81, when Darkus predicted that Brixton would happen. He said that the temperature of the black community is such is that there was going to be a mass revolt in Britain of the black community. And he said that in January when we had our away, our away weekend. And in fact, it happened in March. But the era in which I lived and why I, I get frustrated when people say that there hasn't been change was the era around the fight for black representation. We fought for the, rep for the rights of black people in all aspects of society. So the strategies we had were formed in the heat and in the heart of black working class struggles and we changed. So the magazine that we published wasn't a, like many things you see now, a kind of semi-sociological study of the black community. It was a magazine that in discussing what was going on in the black community, analysed our successes, our failures, and therefore what our strategies should be for future, for future struggles. And the magazine had a, had a national, national readership. We were a political platform for political and social rights. So we just didn't really report on things. As I say, we analysed, we strategised, we invited people who we didn't agree with to, to contribute to the magazine because we wanted a debate. We wanted people who we didn't agree with so that we could challenge them. And that was very, very important to have a discourse and a discussion because of course, as we come now to this generation and, and what goes on, with the attitude of people who you don't agree with, sometimes the dialogue isn't there. So we were a radical group and really we said our mission was to educate and be educated by working class political and, and cultural struggles.
We connected different struggles and we were very international in our outlook. So the pages of race today would have as much as a campaign, say in Harlesden, where six young black women were beaten up by the police um, and we were involved in their campaign and their fight in the courts. Um, you would read an article about what was going on in Dominica and a big fight that in the in the island of Dominica, a tiny island, where they had a very, very strong liberation movement. You would read, of course, about the American struggles, but you would also read about struggles in India, in Africa, and in other parts of the world. We did a whole thing about Detroit and black workers in Detroit. And one of the important things about the collective is that it was a collective of Asians, Africans, black people who've been born here. And um, so our definition of black isn't as narrow as, as some of the definitions of black that I see at the moment. Um, so, you know, we were definitely a collective of immigrant children, people whose parents had come as immigrants or who had themselves had come over from the Caribbean, India and Africa at a very young, young age, our age. So where were we successful when I say that, you know, nothing has changed? When in the era in which I grew up, one of the big campaigns was just to get four black people elected into the Labour Party. The big fight for black sections in the Labour Party. I mean, I know now there, there are many uh, different political persuasions in the Labour Party. But when, we, when, we, when I was around and Darkers and I went to the Labour Party, um, Diane Abbott was hissed and booed by the Labour Party. And so we had to have a struggle just to get four people, Keith Vaz, Diane Abbott, Bernie Grant and Paul Boateng even recognise as their right to be in the Labour Party and to have black sections within the Labour Party. There was a big fight in education and I think the final documentary under the Steve McQueen banner is going to be around the, the education struggles, which were huge. When I was in the Black Unity and Freedom Party, one of the ways we combated the racism in the school system was that we set up our own schools. I mean, I taught for whatever, um, you know, I, I've, I mean, I left school at 16, so I was hardly in any position to teach anybody. But because it was a movement where young people and the older generation were kind of united united in their fight for education. I, I went and taught um, probably English to some kids in a, in a West Indian parents home. And the big fight around education and the struggle to stop children being uh, labelled as educationally subnormal was huge. And of course, that then gave birth to a supplementary school movement. And many people, including Steve McQueen, Akala and others, are products of this supplementary school system, which is an independent movement for education, which the black community itself did. We, we struggled for trade union recognition. Again, when I was around, trade unions did not want black people as members. In fact, they encouraged the division between black and white workers. The pay differential, which the women in Imperial Typewriters, a very famous Asian women's strike, I say famous, famous for my era, and hopefully there will be some documentary around this, but there was a big strike of Asian women in Leicester in the Imperial Typewriter strike. And their strike was around the fact that they really realize that the white workers who they were working side by side with were getting more money than them. And the unions actually made this incredible statement of, the, of these immigrant people can't expect to come here and get the same rights immediately. So there was a huge fight to democratize trade unions, to make trade unions recognize that black, black people had the right to be treated equally with white workers. Um, of course, it was an era of strong National Front activity. Um, column 88, the National Front, race today itself had to have grills up in the office. We would always get these weird phone calls, which we knew were kind of nutty racisms on the other, uh, on the other uh, uh, line. But a huge fight against the National Front. Part of, um, at that time, of course not now, but there were many black bookshops, radical bookshops. The National Front waged a huge campaign against these, firebombing them, putting up racist graffiti. And so we had mass massive protests around what was going on to bookshops and formed the Bookshop Joint Action Committee. So I want to say that I was in a movement and a moment where there was a lot of political activity on all fronts, not just against the police, but on all fronts, on education, housing, um, our, our struggle around housing. We spent three years in the East End of London around the Bengalia Housing Action Committee. This was a group of um, Bengalis who the local community relations council was selling squats to 
and they approached race today with a phone call and on the phone call it merely said we understand you help black people and when we went down there we went down there obviously to support and to see what we could do but we stayed there for three years until we were successful in getting over 300 families rehoused by what was then the GLC so I'm trying to, to show that when you're involved in the way that we were, it's easy to see the successes. And it's not to say we didn't have defeats. Darkus himself, who was the editor of Race Day and a, a very vocal person at that time, was arrested six times. And six times when he was on bail, we were always running around the courts trying to free Darkus from some court case or the other, from the police, from the state onslaught to try and eliminate Darkus, who at that time on which the Black Power papers have now proven was seen as a major threat to, to British society. So what I want to say is, I know the title is strategies and I don't really think I'm in a position to talk about current strategies because I'm not involved currently in movements. But I think once you are engaged in working class activity and that you listen to the people who you're working with, what their demands are and how you can develop that struggle forward so that it doesn't become something that's easily co-opted or that they're persuaded um, that the radical route is not the way, way to go. So one of the things that we had to face, I think, was the onslaught of the state. Know. How many minutes? Two. Oh, sorry. The onslaught of the states to develop a black professional class. And I just want to say that we it grew up in an era um, where black projects, where projects to do all sorts of things were created by the state to try and diffuse the black radical movement. And we had a joke that we would say that if you were black and had a headache, there would be a project for black people with headaches. I mean, there were black projects for everything, housing, education, youth, all aimed to take away the radical current that was in the society. Um, just quickly moving to today, the composition of the working class has changed, the composition of the black community has changed. We see that with the Sewell report, who has tried to uh, pit Africans against West Indians, saying West Indians are doing less well than Africans, and that must be something inherently wrong with West Indians. So I know that today that what faces people is quite different from what, what I faced and what we faced. But today, um, and I think one of the big things about today is that racism is being separated more and more from exploitation. So it's now become a question of unconscious bias, of microaggressions, of divisions um, which are, are being taken away from the fact that basically race is about exploitation, that people at the bottom of society are still at the bottom of society and that the, the struggle of, of all of us is really to dedicate our lives to what we can do to change that. So I've tried to say a little about what we did and how we did it, and it's in the hope that what, what we did and how we did it is of value to those who are currently engaged in political struggle and that they will really have some ideas of, of what you can do to make fundamental change in society today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, it's given us a lot, uh, hopefully, to actually discuss um, and to ask questions. Can I actually remind people that um, you can start raising your hands now if you want to and you can't, can start sending um, your questions in to the chat. Um, our final speaker is um, Wayman Bennett and um, Wayman is a long-standing member of um, the SWP. Um, he's the Joint Secretary of Stand Up to Racism and speaking in a personal capacity today. And he's, um, I think, a well-known activist. Um, so welcome, Wayman. Okay, I'd like to thank Nadia for, um, for what she said. And I wanna really thank uh, Leila for bringing alive um, how, we, uh, how we got here today. I, I think it's um, very important, the lessons that she talked about is part of the reason why we have made progress. And I say that's important because in the Sewell report, it talks about progress as if people like Tony Sewell had anything to do with it or Trevor Phillips had anything to do with it. And it forgets actually it was those struggles that took place led by black people, but black and white people that made a difference. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I was a child who went to the Saturday schools that they talked about. I grew up in London. I grew up in Newham. I went to Railton Road. I saw meetings in which I was given C.L.R. Jones' book, The Black Jacobins, and a book by Pushkin. 
because they wanted you to understand that there were black writers and stuff like that. I, I remember Frank Critchlow in terms of the attempt of the people that they tried to arrest and break down. And the reason why I say this is because there's three things I want to say in this meeting. Firstly, the first thing we have to understand is that resistance is central. The second thing we have to understand is that we're not the first group of people to resist or we've got actually standard attrition. The third thing we have to do is a question of building organizations. So the first question about resistance, let's be honest. When Chavin went to, when Chavin was sent down, and when you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, I'll be honest, I was, I'm so happy, I'm blown away by it, but why? Because when I saw Joy Gardner murdered, when I saw Roger Sylvester murdered, when I saw the De Costas murdered, when I saw the murder of Christopher Older, when you saw, when I went to America and saw the mur murder of Mark Brown, you actually felt that nothing was ever going to change. And actually the reason why we've got change is because people have fought. My grandfather from Jamaica used to say this. He said, the door that squeaks the most gets the most oil. And actually struggle has mobilized and changed that. And that's what the Black Lives Matter movement has actually done. It's since the 19, they, said, they reckon that there was 25,000 demonstrations worldwide. And that is what is actually, that motor, and I think the motor um, links us to the, to the past and the present. And I think that question that Leila brought up about the question of class exploitation, often people, uh, to be honest, my, my 14 year old son says nothing's changed because he's 14 and he's quite right. Nothing's changed for him. He gets stopped and searched by the police and nothing's changed for him. But the difference is, uh, I mean, you know, I always say, I always say to him that the difference was when you used to get stopped and searched under sus when I was growing up, they didn't record it. They didn't have any cameras or anything like that. They used to say, they used to say, I'm, I'm beating you up for your own good and nothing was actually done. And also, I think what's also changed in that was the struggles that the race collective did that question of linking up working class resistance i remember going to a madrasa inside um east london which is now east london mosque by the way it was a it was a it was a um a, 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 a it was a, turned into a school but the question of linking up the different struggles and to, to um there's a there was a, a question of how you how you did that and that's part of my argument the higher the struggle the, um, the more that you, um, you more that you get changed. There was a man called Frederick Douglass when he was doing the West Indian introduction. He says that power concedes nothing without a demand. Power will never concede anything unless um, people fight for it. He says that people who want change without plows, plowing, without um, rain, without thunder, will never get to see change. And it's an amazing speech because I think that's what sums up part of the question that we face today. What is our demand? Yes, black lives matter, but who are we making those demands to actually, actually matters. Liberation has always come through struggle. 1804, the Haitian Revolution. Not 1864, the civil, the, 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 the war, the, um, the American Civil War and the liberation, the defeat of um, the Confederacy. That came out of that struggle, the struggle that Marx and Engels supported. The struggles for African and Indian liberation. The question of 1968 that we talked about that was part of that shaped our generation. And I think that when we talk about strategies, it's important to learn from the strategies of those people that, that, have, that, have, come, uh, that have come before us. Because I think that if you look at um, what um, Fred Hampton in The Black Messiah said, he said, we have to face some facts, that the masses are poor, that the masses, um, he said, that what groups do we want to build? He said that there's a question of the debate amongst black nationalism, black liberation that flourished at the time, what kind of the party he said, the masses belong to what I call the lower classes. And when we talk about the masses, I'm talking about the, whole, the white masses. I'm talking about the black masses. I'm talking about the brown masses. I'm talking about the yellow masses. We say we, you don't fight racism with racism. We're gonna fight racism with solidarity. We say that you don't fight capitalism with not black capitalism. You fight capitalism with socialism. And it's an important question because what people are being told now is to put black faces in high places. To be honest, when I was growing up, there were no black faces except for in other countries, African and in, in, in India, there were no black faces in high places. And we've had Obama, we've had, um, you know, in this country, we've got Priti Patel. We've got, um, 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 Leila was talking about it. I remember the meeting with Russell Prophet and Boateng when they set up black sections. And I remember people being told there'll never be a black MP because white workers would never vote for them. They were wrong about that. They were wrong because actually the truth is that people faced with the same situation look to their common thing and that's a strength but it's not enough because now what we've also been told is look at people like Trevor Phillips, look at people like, um, look at people like Priti Patel, look at the question of the police. 
because I think many young people face being brutalized by the police. And I think we have to be very clear about what it's there for, because some of the arguments is that you can change the police by changing the people inside them. Obviously, Nazis are racist join it because they like treating people that way. But actually, it's, it's an institution in society because it's there to defend the nature of our society. It's, you know, the, 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 you know, there's a reason why it's there. It's not just because there are racist police inside there. It's partly to maintain the order and the status quo in our society. And in order to do that, they use dividing black and white. I think the um, question I want to talk about is a question about what type of organisations we need. Um, there's this book, you know, uh, what white people can do next. Or do you mean, there's all these kinds of discussions taking place as the idea about how do we actually fight? And I wanna argue that I, I think united fronts are the central way of, of fighting. And we talked about my experience has been when I was growing up and facing racism for the National Front and the police, actually the National Front was destroyed by the Anti-Nazi League and Rock Against Racism. The BMP was destroyed by United Against Fascism and the mass movement that took place. The football lads were destroyed by mass activity in order to that. In other words, for me, united fronts are a necessity in terms of building an anti-racist atmosphere that challenges the common ideas. And when you see ideas grow, the racism constantly changed, but it was, you know, one of these things that this book does say is that racism was based on capitalism. And in some sense, we have to talk about strategies to remove capitalism, but also to build organizations that give people a sense of going forward. I've been told that um, the Black Lives Matter movement has received something like two billion pounds in, in, in funding um, and that the idea is to build organizations that are separate uh, from the movement and develop individuals that can can, uh, can can see can see a way forward I think that when you look at black movements they've always faced this question uh, W. E. Du Bois says that when you face the what's going to happen when after reconstruction um, you see CLR Jones raises the quaint question of when he writes the inside the movement about what to do Claude McKay raises the same question I think there's always been a situation where, you know, the leadership in this movement was led by um, a man called William Coffey. Um, uh, you know, the, the, we talk about the trade unions and the Chartist movement. I think we have to have two things. We have to have the United Front, but I also think we have to build um, multiracial revolutionary parties that take the best elements of how you fight today and um, organize um, against racism, but also organize against the system. I think we have a historic role to do that in order to make sure that people don't uh, don't get uh, don't get disappointed. One of the most important things, um, one of the most important things, I, I think, is to look at the two strategies that we've been offered. Um, one strategy is you can change um, society by changing it through um, becoming MPs, becoming lords, but as that as a strategy, almost sometimes having black faces in high places. And I don't think that's actually worked in the United States. And I don't think it's going to continue to work. Um, and, and the reason why I say that is because if you look at the um, black mayors that are in, in America now, they haven't been able to reverse the attacks that are taking place on, 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 the, black lives, on the Black Lives Matter movement. I think what matters uh, most of all in terms of this new movement is that it continues to struggle and it continues to fight. But I also think that we have to have clarity about um, how they're using racism to divide, uh, racism to divide us. Because one of the key things in the Sewell report, I think the reason why they put that forward was the idea to separate that black and white workers have separate interests. Yes, ra racism affects black workers more. Islamophobia affects us in terms of the way that it's used in our society. But the heart of that is the attempt, I believe, is that the ruling class in this country is, is a weak class. The front page of the FT has a blown up um, picture of, of Boris Johnson. Uh, on the front of it. And that's quite right, actually. He's actually full of hot air. It's not true that he actually has a solution for taking Britain fundamentally forward and solving those people, even in the places that, that he's won. It's not true that um, Britain will return back to the 1880s as he talks about global um, Britain and making deals with Modi. Fundamentally, the system cannot provide for what people need. And racism- Three is minutes, used, please, Wayman. Yeah, racism is used as, as a, div a dividing point for that. I think the key question that always comes up is, as my final question is, can you build, um, you know, I, I want to pay tribute to, um, to Darkest How. I want to pay tribute to the, um, the discussions that, were, that took place um, in, the, uh, in, in the 80s about, that, about the question about building revolutionary parties. And I want to make a distinction about why I think 
it's important that um, that you you develop a layer of black revolutionaries and multi multi multiracial revolutionaries that can take this question seriously because um, I think all the things that we've talked about have taken the struggle forward, but what's left intact is uh, a state that um, has changed. It's not the same, you know, you get the right to vote, you get the right for representation, but it's hard, it's driving forces, what Leila said, oppression continues, but so does exploitation. So we have to have a dual strategy to build an organization that challenges the oppression, but also challenges, looks for the question of power, and this is what I, I finally meant to mean. Our power comes out when we take collective action on the streets, but also when we take collective action in, in our workplaces, in when black and white workers come together, because that shows the real power of people to be able to change things. I never forget the Egyptian revolution when the cotton workers marched into the main square inside Cairo. They did two things. They paralyzed the society and they paralyzed the state. And that was led by a black woman wearing a hijab. And actually for us, the question is, how do those people get to rule and control our society? And um, that's the reason why I argue that what we need to do is we need to build a revolutionary party that is connected to both fighting for the reforms that we need in terms of making sure the police don't get away with murders, that you challenge the question of um, disproportionate deaths. But at the same time, we have to build an organization, I think that can can, can, can lead that. And that's, a, I think, a very, very difficult task because as Leila said, the struggle goes up and down. But unless we do that, I think, what you'll end up with, you'll have progress, but you'll end up with a system that continues carrying out its same levels of imperialism, racism, and discrimination. And we have to fight for society that challenges and changes that. And I want to stop there.